Hi everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started with our session today since it's 3 o'clock. Thanks so much for coming to What Works for Health Using County Health Rankings and Roadmaps in Grant Writing. My name is Erin Seeger. I'm the Health Professions Coordinator for the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, Middle Atlantic Region. And in just a moment, I'll introduce you to our other speaker for today. But first, we'll jump into a couple housekeeping items. First, closed captioning is available through the link in the chat box that you see my colleague Hannah sharing. We will record this session and post it on the NNLM YouTube channel in a few weeks. And as a registrant, you'll get automatically get an email notification when the recording is available. We will stop at a few points during the session to answer questions. Please feel free to type them in the chat box as we go along. And we'll also save time to answer any remaining questions at the end. Please make sure that when you chat your questions that you've selected the drop-down that says all participants so that everybody can see what you asked. And we also have a handout with some useful links um, that we'll be referring to during our class today. That handout is being shared um, via a link in the chat box. It will open up a PDF that you can save or print. And the same thing goes for a copy of today's slides. Um, there's a separate link that's sharing a copy of the slides today. So whether you want one or both of those, um, you'll see links to them in the chat box as we go along today. And finally, um, you can claim one MLA CE or one CHES CECH -E at the end of the class. And you can, get, you can do both of these CE options through the evaluation for the course. This evaluation will automatically open up at the end of the session when you exit WebEx. And the first question it will ask you is if you are a certified health education specialist and are seeking credit. So if you have that certification, you would choose yes. If you do not, please select no, and you will be taken to the appropriate evaluation for MLA CE or just for providing us um, your general feedback if you're not looking for CE. And I know a few people that are attending our session today um, may not be familiar with the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. So to give you a brief overview, um, NNLM is a program that's coordinated by the National Library of Medicine to ensure that health professionals and the public have equal access to health information. The U.S. is divided into eight regions with a health sciences library serving as the regional medical library for each region. I'm at the University of Pittsburgh, which is the regional medical library for Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. And in addition to my location in Pittsburgh, there's seven other um, regional medical libraries that you can see on the map here. And all of us support our member organizations in our respective regions through things like training, funding, and resources. And someone would be a potential member to our network if they are an organization that provides health information to the public. So this means that our members are a range of organizations from health sciences libraries and public libraries to hospitals or public health departments. And if you want to learn more specifically about activities going on in your region, you can visit our website, which is nnlm.gov. So to get started with our um, topic for today, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Tony Lewis is a community health strategist providing strategic guidance to grantees of New Jersey Health Initiatives, which is a grant-making program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. As a mentor, coach, and friend, she empowers people working collectively across diverse sectors to achieve long-term equitable opportunities to be healthy. And this requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness and lack of access to food, jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments, and health care. Well, thank you, Erin, and hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Our goal is to make this session very informative, but we'd also like to make it interactive, and that's where we need all of you to kind of chime in in the chat box through comments, questions, so we'll be looking for that throughout the session. Great. 
Yeah, we definitely will. And Tony and I are going to keep this kind of a conversational um, session today. So we'll both be speaking and we'll be swapping um, back and forth between who's chatting and who's presenting. Our objectives for today um, are to describe how to use what works for health when you're writing a grant proposal, um, to define the evidence ratings that you will see in the county health rankings and roadmaps what works for health section that we'll be showing you, and to describe a few examples of past NNLM funded projects that relate to the categories in what works for health that we demonstrate for you. And to start out, we're just going to talk a little bit about the different parts that you might see in a proposal request or when you're, re re when you're writing a grant proposal. And every grant will ask for different information. So it's best to read through their request for proposals carefully before you start writing. Um, as an example, these are sections um, on a proposal um, that we fund in the NNLM Middle Atlantic region. Our funding is actually currently open right now, so if anybody is um, in our region of Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware, um, these are the, the sections that you'll see if you're writing a proposal for us. But um, if you're in a different NNLM region or you're considering funding for a different grant, um, you can usually see what they're asking for right on their, their request for proposals. And I, that's why I won't go through each section in depth today, but I will highlight the sections that are most relevant to our discussion today um, about how to use county health rankings in a proposal. So the evidence of need is one of those, and this is where in this particular application we'd ask you to tell us how this project meets the mission of NNLM and, and how it meets an unmet need in your community. Um, and county health rankings and roadmaps, the what works for health that we'll touch on soon, um, can also help you with your goals and objectives section. Um, and this is where we'd ask for the specifics of what exactly the outcomes are that you're planning to see as a result of your project. And your implementation plan would be how you're going to go about meeting your objectives. And so we'll talk about a little bit of information that can align with those sections as we move forward today. And now we actually have a poll for you. So you're going to go ahead and see that open up on your screen. And we're going to ask you to answer that when you are preparing a grant proposal, which of the following do you usually use before you start writing? Would you say A, a standardized framework, such as a logic model, B, a theory of change, C, a rubric based on scoring criteria, D, would you say none, or sorry, D, would you say one or more of these, and then E would be none of these. So you sh should see that open, and I see people are clicking their answers in right now. So go ahead and let us know which one or more or none of these you typically use. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's just to kind of get an idea of um, uh, where everybody is as we're talking today. All right. So it looks like there's just a few answers still clicking in. I'm going to give you about 20 more seconds to respond, and then we'll look at our results. So it looks like we had um, 18 people said that they use A, two people use B, a theory of change, eight people said they use a rubric based on scoring criteria. Um, and then several of you, actually, 33 out of the 89 people that responded to our poll said they use one or more of these. And then three of you said none, and it looks like we had 25 of you who um, didn't get an answer in. But don't worry, we're going to have one more poll today. Um, so hopefully you can, you can give us your feedback for that one. And I mentioned that we do have one more poll. So um, I'm going to go ahead and open that up, keeping in mind your responses to the last question. And we're going to ask, um, when you're preparing a grant proposal, do you typically reference evidence based on research showing that your proposal will work? And you have a few, a few less choices for this one. You can do A, yes, B, no, or C, I'm not sure. All right. So it looks like those answers are coming in. And we just we wanted to see where everyone in our audience was uh, coming from today uh, so that we know kind of 
um, what you might be looking for, what you're already doing. So I'm just going to give you 20 more seconds to answer if you haven't clicked an answer in. And then we'll look at the results for this one. All right. So it looks like a really large majority of you said, yes, you do do this, 50 out of our 91 respondents. And then we had seven with I'm not sure and one with no. So thanks, everybody, for giving us your feedback on those. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tony, who's going to talk a little bit about logic models. Yeah, great. Thanks, everybody, for chiming in with uh, where you are in these few resources we're going to show you before we get started. Um, first, I want to share that I have had the privilege of being able to write grants, and I've also been able to review grants. Um, and what I know is that a small amount of prep work can really make a difference in grant writing. But apparently, many of the attendees today know this as well, because you use a lot of the tools we're going to go over. Um, but maybe I can share some new insights as we quickly uh, review some kind of prep work you could do. Um, so a logic model is a way to make your work more visible. This is before you write your grant. Um, and it has some components to it. You'll see many different kinds. Uh, but usually, it starts with the input or the resources that exist, human, financial, or other resources. Um, these could include the grant funding, uh, any in-kind or matching funds, staff, volunteer time, uh, supplies, travel, and such. Uh, then there's the activities, or what you're actually going to be doing, what you're going to be doing with those resources. And that's what we're going to spend a little time with later today and exploring what works for health, because there are going to be all of those kinds of strategies we're going to take a look at. Um, then at what about outputs? Um, that is where your work, uh, your implementation of your work, these are kind of uh, the results or concrete qualified indicators of what you did and what you produced. And outcomes are the short, intermediate, or long-term benchmarks for your target population during and after the activities that you implement. But finally, impact. This is the big change or the fundamental change that's anticipated from your work. Um, and I just think uh, I, we have to share this wonderful uh, example that Erin has. So Erin, take it away and show us what a, a logic model kind of can look like. Yeah. Thanks for that description, Tony. Um, this is kind of just a fun visual of a logic model if you haven't used one before. And it's using an example that we're all really familiar with, which is a birthday party. Um, and this was actually an example that was created by the NNLM National Evaluation Office. Um, and they have a lot of good examples and little blog posts and documents if you wanted to look those over. And those are linked in the handout for today's class if you want to take a deeper dive. But um, this is a birthday party logic model if you were throwing a party for a three-year-old. And you can see that the inputs for the party are things like decorations and cupcakes. The activities are blowing out candles, eating those cupcakes. And then there's some short-term outcomes, such as the birthday girl and, of course, her friends have a good time at the party. Her parents feel relaxed at least 60% of the time. Um, and then this is kind of leading into our medium and long-term outcomes of the daughter is enjoying, her friends coming over again, um, the parents are comfortable with this in the future, and that they feel good about throwing future birthday parties. Um, and so this is just a fun way to think about what those inputs might look like if you, um, you know, haven't written a logic model before. And if you haven't, I encourage you to check out the handout for today's class, too, and, and look at those other resources from the National Evaluation Office. That's really great, Erin. It's so relatable to think about that long-term change that the family actually wants to have future birthday parties. Um, so a theory of change is an alternative to a logic model. Um, you can use a theory of change to describe your initiative. It's maybe a little simpler in the fact that really it just asks you, like, what is it you plan to do? And who are you targeting for the results you expect to achieve? And why are you doing it, the purpose behind it, how you plan to do it, and what you expect to achieve. And grant reviewers, I can assure you, really want to understand your theory. Absolutely. And um, 
in addition to having the theory or the logic model, um, it's also a good idea to know um, that the people assigned to review a grant proposal um, are given guidance on how to score what they read. So here's an example of what we use. This is an NNLMR um, evaluation of a proposal. And you can see that we, we use a five-point scale um, to rate different um, aspects of the proposals that we read. Um, and this is posted right on our funding page, so you can look this over. And most, I think most grants have that available for you to know how you would be scored. Um, and something that can be really helpful is that Tony is going to show you how to use um, this reviewer criteria process to improve um, the quality of your proposal. So <clears throat> what you see here is actual questions that were taken from a grant proposal, a recent one from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, what we did here is just create a word a chart um, and let that be our template to answer those questions. Um, what's maybe different than, uh, about this, uh, if the funder gives you a template, is that, yeah, there's a space or a column to answer those questions, but there is also, um, as you can see at the top, a column to give a rating and for reviews. This way, what you can do is write the answers to the questions that were in the proposal that the funder seeks to, to hear about, um, and then hand over the document to someone either inside your organization or even outside your organization to rate the quality of your answers and use, ask them to use the comments section to give you feedback on why they gave it that rating. Um, in this way, it gets handed back to the writer who can improve those answers um, and really strengthen the proposal. And this process will really make sure that you have, for one, answered all the questions and that your answers are really clear and appropriate. Uh, simply at the end, you can erase the grid lines and copy and paste all the text. Uh, you may be directly into the submission form or, you know, read it over again would be a good idea and put in any kind of transition sentences to make your proposal really strong. Thanks, Tony. I think that's a really cool idea and really helpful um, when you're trying to think through what am I going to say in every one of these sections. Um, and now that we've gone over some things like the logic model, the theory of change, um, kind of that introductory content, we wanted to take a pause and see if there's any questions in the chat box. Or if you haven't typed one in but you have one, feel free to ask about what we've covered so far. Um, and as we're looking for these two, I also um, encourage you to think back um, to that poll question about if you use a logic model or a theory of change when you write a proposal. If you answered no, um, can you think of a partner who might support you in, in doing this, either inside or outside your organization? Or if you answered yes, are there people that you currently partner with when you develop a proposal? Because sometimes that can be helpful, like Tony mentioned when she was talking over giving that rubric over to somebody to help you um, score it, it can be helpful to ask somebody to even support that logic model development. So like we said, we do, we do love to have interactions and um, keep, this, keep this fun, keep it um, conversational today. So please feel free to share any feedback you have um, or um, ask us any questions. Um, so I'm not seeing many questions. There's a statement about the definition of the theory of change and the logic model, I believe. So um, Tony just talked about those a moment ago, where the logic model was, for example, the birthday party, where we were showing the inputs, the activities, and the outcomes. And then the theory of change was kind of when she had described that other way of you know, thinking about what a project may look like, um, what yeah. shows that it's going to work. Yeah, so uh, what I can tell you is that um, they are frameworks for getting your writing started, getting your thinking started, especially if you're working with partners. Um, if there's several of you that are going to be working together on this, it's a good idea to, to, to collaborate in developing the logic model, which is, it looks like it's linear, it goes from left to right, but you know, the work is not always linear, but it helps you kind of get all your ideas down about 
what you plan to do um, before who, whoever is going to be writing the proposal actually writes it, because then they can see the story, like kind of from beginning to end. Glad, I'm glad that helped, Cal. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions before we move on, or um, just other comments about their, how they currently write or use um, these planning tools that we talked about? Do you have URLs for evaluation of proposal? Um, so um, at NNLMR, which is who I can mostly speak for, um, there's a link in the handout for today's class to our regional funding opportunities. So that would be for New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. If you're not in one of those states, you would just have to go to nnlm.gov and find your region, and then they should have a funding tab. But um, typically, when you select the type of proposal on that, that page that's describing the proposal, you know, this is the mission, this is what we're looking for in the types of projects we fund, we link that evaluation of proposal that I shared, and it says this is how we would evaluate it. And a lot of, um, I'd say most other, um, funders have that too, where they share on that request for proposals um, how they're going to score it and how it would be evaluated. And if they don't have it, I would say I'm just going to jump in and answer Hannah and, Hannah and say I think it's a good idea to develop what you think might be the way it's going to be evaluated, creating your own idea of, you know, because there's usually sections of the proposal. And you imagine that the proposal is going to have be weighted depending on which section um, is completed. So yeah. that's what the template I showed was about really just kind of creating your own way of evaluating the proposal's quality. And notice that there were sections. And each the, the funder is likely going to give each section a different weight, like maybe the introduction might only have 10% where the strategies that you employ, which we're going to go over shortly, might have more like 30%. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're, when you're evaluating it yourself before you submit it, of course. Yeah, definitely. That's so keep true. asking questions and... Uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and, and move on to the next section, I think. But yeah, we'll stop again for questions, so feel free to type them in any time you have them throughout. Um, but Tony's going to go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, county health rankings and roadmaps. So if you haven't used it before, uh, and if folks have used it, I'd love to hear you chime in in the chat. But it's countyhealthrankings.org is the website. Essentially, uh, when you get to the first page where Erin is right now um, of the site, you can scroll down and you can see the map of the U.S. And Erin's going to just, we're just going to do a quick deep dive into one state, Pennsylvania, and take a look at, like, what do we see here? So the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, very powerful website, has a lot of resources. But one thing that it sets out to do is rank the health of every county, every state in the entire nation. Um, and what we see here in Pennsylvania is a whole lot of counties, uh, 67 precisely, as you can see. And Erin, um, maybe you could just highlight the county that you live in. Uh, all right, Allegheny County. Okay, wonderful. So what we see here is where Allegheny County is. It's like in the middle there. It's ranked on overall health outcomes. That's how long the length of our life. Um, 34, or like midway between all the counties in Pennsylvania. As you scroll down, you have a lot of data here um, with very active hyperlinks that you can click on and get more information and more information and more information. So a, we're not going to be spending time doing this today, but I want you to know that there's over 50 measures here for every county. Um, and if you're looking for sub-county data, that's doable too by just clicking on some of the measures. And it takes you right to the data source. As you can see right here, thanks, Erin, you're doing a great job. And you can go directly to the website and, uh, you know, uh, see if you can find more. Uh, if you need data at the census, if, if it's available, uh, you can find the data at a, at a sub-county level. 
So we're not going to spend time on the rankings and the data piece today because we promised you we'd talk about strategies. Uh, when you think about the theory of change or what you're, what you're actually going to do, uh, the strategies, uh, what works for health is something that has over 400 strategies. So I want to take a look at that today to help you write your grant proposal. So if we look at what works for health, and you'll see that the strategies are kind of like highlighted by different topic areas, uh, you know, using the definition of health very broadly to include health behaviors, clinical care, social and economic factors, and the physical environment. Erin, um, how about we take a look at tobacco use for today? Okay. Um, so what we see here right away is that there's over 19 different strategies under just this topic, this health area topic. And um, what we're going to do is kind of look at two a little closely. Um, what do you think about selecting two different ones and we'll compare them? How does that sound? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at this one that's right at the top of the screen, cell phone-based tobacco cessation intervention. So here we go. That's the strategy. And you'll notice on the left here we have evidence. We take a look at what we mean by evidence and look at the definition there. Okay, what we see is a lot of different ratings that could occur, meaning that we don't just include things that work. We actually, the actually website includes things that don't work. <laughs> so, and how do we know that? It's based on research. So when we rank, rate something that is scientifically supported, that means there are many different studies that exist that show that there have been consistently positive results. It doesn't mean that we don't want to do something that does, has less than that, like if something has some evidence or an expert opinion, I think that those are important too. It just means that um, there's very limited research. So if you folks are interested in writing research and on the work that you're doing, that, that might be some opportunities there. So notice you can print the strategy if you want to keep a copy of it, share it, do a presentation about it, etc. Um, but what I want you to know is there's an explanation on what the strategy is, linking directly to research. Um, you can use this language uh, directly in your proposal. You can explain what it is and why it works. And not only that, remember we had the logic model earlier, we have some, can we scroll back up to the top, we actually have when we use the strategy, what are the outcomes? Remember, we had outcomes as one of the things we actually can expect for this particular strategy to increase uh, quit rates. So that's the strategy, and that's how we employ it. Um, that's what we would see. Notice, too, on the left, uh, those are the folks that you have to work with to get this kind of strategy, or could work with and should work with people in business, government, and public health um, to make the intervention effective. We scroll back to the bottom of the screen. One thing I want to point out to you is that this particular strategy, we look at disparities. Right? And we will look at a definition of disparities, but that just basically means the differences or the gaps in health that exist among different populations. So if we're looking to reduce the gaps that exist, um, between populations. For this particular strategy, it, it's, it's based on research. It's not going to be effective in reducing disparities. So let's look at a different one. We can see that that's clearly a program. It does work. It's scientifically supported. Um, it doesn't uh, address equity necessarily because of what we saw, but, but depending on how you employ it, uh, it could. So let's take a look at something else. How about we look at something more, how about this one, smoke-free policies for indoor areas. Many of you are probably familiar with this one. Um, again, this is scientifically supported. It, we can use the language if this is something you're going to do in your work or a strategy you can employ in your community. Um, it talks about kind of how it works. Uh, and again, we can see in this case, let's take a look at the outcomes we can expect if this strike. So there's a lot more outcomes here and a lot more opportunities to address a number of different different factors, huh? So it's very interesting. Um, how about we look at the impact on disparities for this? Does it look? Okay, again, no impact on disparities. But keep in mind that by employing it, <clears throat> 
differently with different populations or putting all your resources where the populations that need it most that are more affected in this case by tobacco use, obviously that's one way to kind of adjust your, adjust your work. Erin, is there anything you notice when you kind of look at these two examples or any questions? Yeah. Um, I think it's really interesting to think about when we're talking about what works for health. The title of this section of the site is that we, we can see that there are policies and programs. So it really just depends, I think, what you would be looking to do in your community, right? You know, mm -hmm. are you trying to do something where you're coaching people to quit, or are you trying to reduce exposure in those indoor areas with a policy? So I think that's really interesting to think about here. And then also, um, I think it can be nice to think a little bit about when Tony was talking about health disparities, um, you had said, you know, that where's the impact, you know, who is it going to work for? And I think mm -hmm. that's interesting to think about in that when we say scientifically supported, um, it's scientifically supported, but for who and for which groups? And so I think that that's really interesting. That's really great. And to, to kind of just for the folks on the phone that want to get a definition, we have a really nice definition about equity and disparities. If we scroll up, you can go to the top of the screen and you'll see um, where it says, what is health? Um, in there, we can see uh, the de oops, a little bit further up, you can see the definition of disparities. Those are the differences in health or the key determinants of health, such as education, safe housing, and discrimination, which adversely affect marginalized or excluded groups. So reducing health disparities means that's where we want to focus on groups that are marginalized or excluded. Um, Erin, do you want to read the one on health equity? Yeah. So it's telling us that it means that everyone has fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. So this requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty and discrimination, uh, the consequences like powerlessness, lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments, and health care. Okay. And there's actually, um, I know we weren't going to stop for a lot of questions now, but somebody has asked a pretty relevant question to where we are. So I'll just read that one out. Um, they said, I don't understand what that means, the impact on disparities. Does that functionally mean that it hasn't been tested or doesn't work with minority populations? Yeah, so to really answer the question, I appreciate that question so much you actually have to read the whole section because each one explains, each different strategy will have a different explanation and it does explain where it's effective. So let me give you an example. It's like it's possible an intervention would actually work potentially with men but not with women, for example. So an, a population, a huge population, right, women, is being excluded. That would likely uh, have, a, you know, it's not going to impact on disparities because we want to make sure that, especially if women are marginalized in that particular example of a strategy. Um, so yes, potentially mar minority populations, but really it kind of comes down to the populations that are most impacted by the particular issue, in this case, tobacco cessation. Thanks. That's really interesting. So it's kind of thinking about um, who is experiencing um, the, a disparity and right. um, does this does this close the gap, basically? Does this That's right. strategy close the gap for that disparity? Right. right. So they have to be affected by it. So especially if we're looking at things related to maternal, to maternal health, it's going to be mostly women that are more affected by maternal health issues whoever that population might be. And, and we know that there's dis, uh, dis, disparities, and if we want to reduce that difference, then we the strategy may not be effective. However, again, it comes down to how you, how you employ it. And that's all explained in this text. Thanks Great. for that. Great question. Thanks for that answer. I think that's really interesting. Um, so I think we're going to move on and look at another example, um, but keep those, um, those questions coming through. 
And Tony, um, which one, which example would you do, want to do next? Yeah, so I was thinking that we look at uh, community health workers next. How okay. about that? Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and search that right down at the bottom. All right. Yeah, so again, keep in mind as we're writing our grant proposal, all the information you need to describe this project is here. So let's select Community Health Workers, click on that. Everything you need is in here. The pieces of the logic model, our theory of change. Um, it's about the population, which population is affected by this, especially when we mention things like breastfeeding and birth weights. We understand, depending on the population, who's more affected by that. Um, we look at research and evidence. It's all in here if you want to cite a particular research study. But not only that, and I don't think we've shown this, that these are real live links. So um, depending on whether you have access, it really takes you right to the research. Can't tell you how many people have told me how excited they are when they see this. So in that case, you can really understand more about why it was effective, what made it more effective, what uh, what allowed it to address disparities, how they addressed equity, et cetera. So um, keep in mind, again, we also have our, um, let's take a look at this, uh, potential outcomes. Where, what, what if we use this strategy? What's cool, too, if you're interested, is you can read about how Indiana community health workers were trained to support mental health. So again, in this case, an intervention was specific to a population most likely uh, that's affected by mental health disparities, right? Then we know that it's going to be equitable. So this particular strategy, does it have an impact on health disparities? Well, let's look. Okay, in this case, it does. Again, if you read, I love that question from before, you don't understand why that is, it actually explains it in the previous text. You'll find the answer to that question, where it's going to be more, um, more effective, how to make it more effective. And that's interesting here that you're saying it's explained here. So it looks like they're also talking about community health workers as a whole, but then on different health conditions, um, mm -hmm. cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease, diabetes. Um, immunization. So right. That's really Thanks. cool to see that they've looked at it in a lot of topics. That's right. That's right. And that's why, and the goal would be, again, to reduce health disparities in all of those areas. Apparently, this will work for those that are more affected or more likely to not receive immunizations and more affected by cardiovascular disease, looking at disparities in that way. Um, um, Keep the questions coming in. We really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And to kind of go ahead and share an example of what a community health worker intervention or project might look like, I actually wanted to um, share a little bit about two projects, actually, that we've funded in the past at um, the National Network of Libraries of Medicine in the Middle Atlantic region. Um, they either employed or trained community health workers. So the first one um, was in 2018 or 20, and 2019. Um, we worked with the Northeast Pennsylvania Area Health Education Center. And they um, got funding to do some updates to their community health worker training curriculum. They'd actually been doing a training for community health workers since 2009, but they, um, they made some, some changes and things to it. And one of those was to include some health literacy activities. And um, that is the picture that you actually see on the left side of your screen. And they're in, they're in front of a screen. It's a little hard to see, but it says Medline Plus which is the National Library of Medicine Consumer Health Portal. And they trained their uh, community health workers to use that so that they could get health information out to the community. And then currently, um, in the Middle Atlantic region, we're funding a women's wellness program at the um, African Cultural Alliance of North America. And they're located in Philadelphia. Um, ACANA is their, their acronym. They serve um, African and Caribbean immigrants. 
And of their many valuable programs, they do a whole lot. Um, just one thing that they do is their women's wellness workshop series um, where women gather to learn about women's health on a regular basis. And these sessions are facilitated by peer educators who Akana recruits from the community and trains. Um, and you can see them on the right side there with the list of services that are that are offered by Acana. Um, and again, they they um, use our consumer health portal Medline Plus in their work, which is um, a great way to make sure that people are linked to high quality health information. Um, and the first project I talked about, the community health worker training. Um, somebody from their organization actually did a webinar for us last June, and that you can access a recording of that if you're interested in more specifically on that project, and it's linked in the handout for today's class. Yeah, I love the way that community health workers, I'm noticing now that, um, you know, it's not just about access to health care. They really are defining health in a very broad sense. Look at that, legal services. Um, and. Um, uh, arts, the arts, and employment, I mean, it's very, very broad, so that's, that's great. Yeah. All right. So how about we look at another example uh, beyond community health workers? Let's see if we can find another strategy uh, around um, physical activity. Um, if we go into diet and exercise, that's a category, and we see there's 76 strategies there. Um, I'd like to take a look at... Um, Thank you. Community-wide uh, physical activity campaigns. Now, in this case, again, this one has some evidence. That means that they're likely to work, but further research is needed to confirm that they work, right? It's been tested more than once. And there are some research studies here that are showing this. Again, the definition, really pretty easy on this one. Um, it's an opportunity, it's physical-wide Physical activity campaigns involve many community sectors or highly visible, broad-based, multi-component strategies um, and may address cardiovascular disease risk factors. Um, what can we see in terms of outcomes? We can see people becoming more physically active, which is exactly what we want to do, and maybe they will improve their weight status and, and, and get more involved in physical fitness. So this is a great activity to employ. Uh, again, we go to health disparities, and I wonder if you're guessing where this one's going to go. Um, it's going to have no impact on health disparities. Um, it's really in order to get a better impact, um, the, the, the actual initiative has to be done for folks that are more likely to be physically inactive. So it depends on how we use the intervention. That's interesting. Um, yeah, and so it's kind of thinking about um, who it's applied to, I guess, is what you're saying. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. And there's some implementation resources there, as you can see. So you can uh, scroll down and see how communities have maybe made it more equitable uh, with the examples here. Oh, that's great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to get started on something like that, there's a neat little resource that you can use. Okay, interesting, yeah. Um, and a project funded from, again, from the Middle Atlantic region here at NNLM that I thought would be really relevant to highlight was something called the Library Moonwalk. Um, and this was a program that we funded in 2018 and 2019. It was funded at the um, Mohawk Valley Southern Adirondack and Upper Hudson Valley Library System. And they had several goals. One of their goals was to provide programs for the public. And one of these programs was related to physical activity. Um, and in addition to things like classes and community education that related to physical activity, they developed the website that you can see here where members of the community could actually come and log their their exercise. It's a little hard to see, but what they were able to do was input either their steps, their miles, or their minutes. And they had a community-wide collective goal of walking to the moon. So at the time that this screenshot was taken, um, they had done 70,350 miles, and they had 168,550 miles to go to get to the moon. Um, but it was cool that they were kind of doing that as um, uh, a community, you know, they were they were getting there together. 
Um, and they did a lot of cool social media memes and um, a big kickoff event to get people excited about the campaign. And just like the last example, um, they did a, a webinar for us last spring, and you can see the recording um, through clicking the link that's in the handout for today's class. So that they did a great job explaining this project as well. It's really fun. I love the way it incorporates learning and tracking and walking and, when, and in, includes so many different kind of folks. So um, I know that one of the uh, most interesting interventions that uh, is very close and near and dear to the heart of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine is health literacy work. So. I'm not quite sure where that's going to show up, whether it be on access to care. Or you can always search for strategies. Let's show, let's show them how to do that okay. by going to the bottom there. Yeah, and just like type in health literacy. Um, and that way, you get right to it, right? So there you go. And there's a couple that actually support that. Again, this one, similar to the last one we demonstrated, um, you know, has the same evidence rating. It's got some evidence. There's more research that's needed. But it explains really well what health literacy is, why it's important, right? And then how, when used, when we, we work on it, what we can expect to achieve, right? What we can, what we can see improve. Um, in this case, um, we know it's effective because of these various research studies, you know, how it's effective. Um, and it has um, a likelihood to uh, decrease health disparities. Um, people that learn about um, health literacy, you know, can be more empowered to address their health needs, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. So, Erin, you have a great example of this, I Absolutely. remember. Yeah. A lot of what we do here um, relates back to health literacy in some way. And I do have a really cool example. Just one thing that I kind of wanted to ask before we move away from this page is when we're thinking back to our logic model for, for anybody in the audience who might be kind of a visual learner and still picturing that logic model, um, Tony, would you say that where we're here at these beneficial outcomes, those would be kind of that, that right-hand side, right? Like those short, medium, or long-term outcome. Yep. And then the activities right. you'd probably find down in this evidence of effectiveness section. Um, um, I, I would say that the, you're right, absolutely, kind of that this evidence of effectiveness really just helps to support why you're doing this work with any funder uh, it, or anybody. It may not be a funder. Maybe you have to talk about it uh, with the healthcare organization, or maybe you have to talk about it with uh, policymakers. So it really helps to explain it. But I would say overall, the activity is health the health literacy gotcha. intervention, and the outcomes yes would be in the logic model um, as described above. That's what you can actually, if you look at those again, those are things you can actually measure. Keep that in mind. We can measure a change in health related knowledge, et cetera. So That's thanks really for cool. asking that question. Yeah. And again, notice on the left who needs to be involved in this work. So remember the input. We better have partners maybe in these areas, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's almost that this evidence of effectiveness then would be in that like evidence of need section or mm -hmm. why this is going to be a good idea for your community. It's the why. It's the yeah. why in the theory of change. Why mm -hmm. the why behind the work? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and then it might just be up to you to do a little digging on what specific health literacy activities you're going to do. That's right. OK, great. Well, as we're talking about health literacy activities, um, like Tony said, I do have um, an example of um, a health literacy project that we funded. And like I said, um, this one is really explicitly targeting health literacy, but you know, because our focus is um, equal access to health information. A lot of our projects do in, in some way. Um, and the, the first appropriate project here is not actually a project that we funded, but one that we created ourselves and then make available uh, online for free. And that's a program called Engage for Health. And this teaches people how to communicate effectively with their health care provider and how to locate high quality health information if they're searching online. 
And the materials that are available for people to use are things like a presentation, a role play, an online activity, and promotional materials. So somebody like a public library or a community-based or faith-based uh, organization could go to our website. There's a link in the handout to the Engage for Health program. And you can use that, that program. Um, and the idea is that uh, a lot of people could pick it up and run it without a whole lot of planning. And then a creative way that Engage for Health was used within a project that we funded was in 2018 and 2019, a group called Philadelphia Fight, um, which is a federally qualified health center that has an on-site library. Their library is called the Critical Path Learning Center. They developed this um, multi-session class about health literacy. And their, their class was called Upgrade Your Health. But within Upgrade Your Health, they, they took our Engage for Health program and basically use those materials within their bigger project. Um, and you can see they also used some uh, NIH um, educational tools called Talking with Your Doctor um, to help people understand why it was so important. And then their program almost kind of expanded on some other, some other topics, but they were able to take all of our Engage for Health materials and just use them as part of their funded project. Yeah, I really love those questions for the doctors. Um, you know, it's informed consent. You know, before you do any work or get any tests or uh, do treatment, it's important to understand and ask the right questions. That's really cool. Um, and how many of us are doing that, that uh, see healthcare providers? Uh, and hopefully everybody does see a healthcare provider at some point um, to maintain your health. So again, today we've been talking and using a tool on the County Health Rankings website called County, CountyHealthRankings.org. Um, and this uh, image comes from the section that we showed earlier called What is Health? And like, like uh, Carol said, it, it's got the great definitions that you guys can use. Uh, and um, this image here uh, helps us to think about the work that you're doing from an equity standpoint. You know, I think we all think about equality. It's so easy to give everybody the same thing, right? Um, but what, what I want you to think about when you look at this slide is, you know, who's able to participate and who is not, and how can we include those that are that that may find it difficult to participate for whatever reason? How can you shift your the opportunity of your program project or policy so that everyone can be included. In the example that Erin gave earlier, the library moonwalk, you know, you can track acti activity for folks that walk with a wheelchair, right? So there was opportunities to be more inclusive. Um, so for today's, uh, today's uh, webinar, we'd like you to think about the information that we've shared. We propose that it's be used for potentially grant writing to really strengthen up your proposals through, um, we talked a little bit about using some prep work, which so many of you already do, uh, and uh, creating a template uh, to really confirm that you've answered all the questions in the grant proposal and that they're answered clearly. Um, using uh, a real grant reviewer before you actually come across, I mean, a, a someone that you know to review your grant before the grant reviewer actually does. Uh, we talked about doing that. And finally, this What Works for Health tool that really can give you language and evidence and the research, uh, you can cite the researches to promote whatever you want to do to a funder. Um, so think about how might you use this information today. Yeah. Tony, I think that was so helpful, and it was really exciting to have you here and kind of talk through this process with you. Um, I think sometimes writing a grant proposal can be um, sort of intimidating if you're if you're not familiar with it. And I think that um, the way that County Health Rankings, this What Works for Health, lays the information out kind of makes it a little more digestible, especially in my mind when you're thinking about plugging that into your logic model. So. I hope that um, our audience found it helpful today, too. 
Um, and we have about five minutes, and we'd, we'd love to hear what questions um, you all have, um, either for myself or for Tony, as we're, as we're wrapping up today. So please feel free to type those in the chat box, and we'd be happy to answer. I see that Cal wrote that this uh, information is really helpful. The content is uh, for graduate level research and investigation on topic areas. Great. Glad to, glad to see that you see it as user friendly. Helpful for research. Yeah, definitely. And I especially myself really like the evidence rankings. Um, I like that you can see what's scientifically supported and what maybe isn't. Because um, sometimes you see something and you think, oh, well, these people did it. Um, but like, how many other people have done it? And um, what does it say when you look at it, the idea as a whole? So does anyone else have questions? Um, somebody just has a comment that they're new to grant writing, but this will help me get started. Um, that the evidence-based information is really important. Absolutely, and I hope it's I hope it's helpful. Um, there's a lot of um, useful links in the handout that Hannah has been sharing, like I said, to some other webinars that we've done um, here at NNLM, as well as the like the Engage for Health program, the link to County Health Rankings itself. Um, the handout has been shared through a link in the chat box by my colleague Hannah. Um, and that will show up as a PDF, and you're welcome to print it or download it and save it, and all the links should be in there. Um, and you can also see the contact information for myself and Tony um, on the screen here. Um, and so um, feel free to, to reach out to us if there's something that, we, that you didn't think to ask today. Um, but it looks like we're not, we're not seeing a whole lot of other questions in the chat box. We'll probably hang on for a couple more minutes in case somebody um, you know, has something um, come across their mind. But otherwise, we just so greatly appreciate your attendance today. And I really appreciate Tony taking the time to come and be our guest presenter. Um, and um, I, I hope it was helpful. If anybody, like I said at the beginning, is looking for continuing education, you can claim that through the survey, the, the evaluation that will op it opens up automatically when you close out of the, the WebEx session. Um, and please just know which one you're selecting. We offer CHES CE and MLA CE. The first question is, are you CHES certified? You would know if you are. <laughs> so <laughs> yes or no. <laughs> and then it will take you to the correct survey from there. Um, so. Um, that if anybody's wondering about that piece. Um, and then um, we'll probably stay on one more minute before we close out. Otherwise, um, you know, we appreciate you all coming today. And I'm glad that so many of you are saying it was helpful. Yeah, and thanks for being so interactive. I'm seeing all, every, all of you signing off and, and being so appreciative. Well, we're really appreciative appreciative of all of you. We had great attendance today. Uh, you have our contact information. I can't speak for Erin, but I can assure you that I'm happy to hear from you directly. Uh, if you have any thoughts, ideas, questions, I can either get you the answers or may, I may have them. <laughs> uh, I saw somebody ask a question about how often is the information updated. Good news on that. Great question. It's actually annually updated, but I can also tell you there's a date on all of those um, various strategies we showed. So if you scroll down to the bottom, there's a date when it was last. The strategy is updated, but the data is updated annually. That's great. And uh, Tony, do they add new strategies annually as well? Yes, yes. And they're interested in hearing what strategies you want to add. I can actually share with you that I I am responsible for adding a few of them to there because I wanted to know about childhood savings accounts, for example. How effective are they? Well, they weren't up there. Eventually, they made it up there and they did research. They have a team of researchers that reads all the research that's available on various strategies. And some people are asking about getting the materials after the class. Um, if you're having trouble um, downloading from the link, please just send me an email, um, and I'm, I'd be happy to share those with you. Um, the evaluation should auto-open when you leave our session today, but if you have any issues, again, please just send me an email, and I'd be happy to help you out. 
Okay, well, right at 4 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and end our session for today. But um, thanks again, everybody, for, for joining us. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel. Select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.